It's good to see you here today in the Lord's house. Would you take God's Word, please, and would you open to the New Testament book of 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, and uh, we're going to read a few verses out of that. So would you stand for the reading of God's Word as we look at 2 Thessalonians chapter number 1. We'll start at verse number 1 there in 2 Thessalonians. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus, under the church of the Thessalonians, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus. Grace unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is me, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all towards each other aboundeth so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye also suffer. Thank you so very much. You may be seated. May God bless his word to our hearts here today. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege we have to go to the word of God Lord, would you please give us instruction and encouragement and comfort and even challenge on every believer that's here today. And we pray if there's someone here today that's never repented of their sin and put their faith in Christ, that the Holy Spirit would open their eyes to see the beauty of Jesus and they would come to Christ today. Bless your word as it goes forth for your honor and your glory, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. I want to preach today on the topic, Why Do the Righteous Suffer? Deborah Roberts was a young college student. She was a a godly young Christian woman. She loved the Lord. She wanted to serve the Lord. And she had a burden for the inner city of Chicago, and she gave her summers to serving the Lord in uh, in an inner city ministry there in Chicago. But that service was interrupted one day at knife point when an evil man uh, beat and raped this godly young lady. And as she lay helpless and forsaken, by this ordeal, she asked the question, God, why? Why would you allow this to happen to me? Perhaps um, you've asked that question yourself, and this really brings up the age-old question of why do the righteous suffer? And along with that, why do the wicked seem to prosper? It seems like evil men get away with evil deeds like this against the righteous, And it seems like they're prospering, those who don't know the Lord, the ungodly, and the righteous are suffering. This is a question that's been asked many times. For example, in Psalm 94, verse 3, the psalmist asks this question, how long shall the wicked triumph? And then Jeremiah the prophet in Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 1, he said this, Righteous art thou, O Lord, when I plead with thee. God, I know that you're righteous in all of your judgments, you're holy. And then he says this, Yet let me talk of thee of thy judgments. Wherefore doth the way the wicked prosper? Wherefore are all they happy that deal very treacherously? God, why is it that the righteous seem to suffer and the wicked prosper? And Jeremiah asked that question while he personally was suffering for his faithfulness to the word of God. God, why is this so? In fact, in Psalm 73, this very issue was causing the psalmist to have a crisis of faith. He wrote this in Psalm 73, verse 2, but as for me, my feet were almost gone, my steps had well nigh slipped, for I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Seeing the wicked prosper all around him almost caused this psalmist to just walk away completely from his faith. And then he wrote this in verse 5. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. God, I look around, it just seems like those who are ungodly, they don't really seem to have any troubles, they're not plagued like other men. You know, we who are trying to live for you and serve you, we have it difficult, we have it hard, but those who are wicked don't have troubles. And then he wrote this in verse 7, their eyes stand out with fatness, they have more than their heart could wish. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression, they speak loftily, they set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walketh through the earth. God, it just seems like the ungodly have all that their hearts desire, and rather than giving you thanks for what they have, what do they do? They, they speak against you. They set their mouth against the heavens. They blaspheme your name. And then he writes this, Verily I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocency. He's saying, you know, it feels like 
that me trying to be righteous, confessing my sins, living a godly life, it just seems like it's all in vain. Uh, what a thought there. He, he says, for all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. And then he says this, if I should say, I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the children of thy generation. In other words, he's saying, if I really spoke out loud the things that I was thinking, it would offend a lot of people on this issue. Uh, by the way, it, it's a little indicator there that we shouldn't always say everything that we're thinking. The psalmist said, if I really said what I really thought, it would offend so many people. And so he was having a crisis of faith over this one issue that the wicked seem to prosper and the righteous suffer. Maybe you've had similar thoughts. I'm trying to live for God. I'm trying to do the best that I can. Uh, my neighbor who doesn't know the Lord, it just seems like they're prospering and I'm struggling. Why is it that way? Now, the first chapter of 2 Thessalonians addresses this issue. And let me give you a little background into the Thessalonians. If you've been here, you know that we've, we studied first Thessalonians, and now we're going to go into the second letter. Paul started this church in Thessalonica. He wasn't there very long. You remember that he was driven out of town by his enemies. But while he was there in Thessalonica, God did a great work. Many people turned to the Lord from idols to serve the living and the true God. God did a tremendous work in the heart, so much so that the faith was being sounded out. People all over Macedonia were hearing about the faith of this, these believers here at this church. But Paul had to leave. Again, he was running out of town, and he was very concerned about the, the church that he left behind. So he wrote 1 Thessalonians, and he encouraged them to stand strong in their faith. But a few months after he wrote 1 Thessalonians, now he writes 2 Thessalonians, the persecution and the suffering that these believers had been going through did not lessen. In fact, it intensified. They were suffering even more. And so Paul, in the face of all of this, wants to encourage them. But notice that in verse 4, he uses two words to describe the persecution of these believers. He uses the actual word persecution, which the Greek word means a systematic, organized program to persecute. They weren't being persecuted haphazardly. This was a organized system to try to basically stamp out this church and these believers. We're seeing this in our world today. We don't see this so much in America. I do believe, however, that if the Lord tarries, we will have to stand for our faith in this country, and persecution will come. But in other countries in the world, we're seeing this. If you're a Christian, one of the most dangerous places to live is in Nigeria. Believers there are enduring a systematic program of severe persecution. Over this past Christmas, almost 200 Christians were murdered in 26 villages in Nigeria. They were killed by Muslims. And the governor of Nigeria declared a week of mourning in honor of the death of these Christians that were there. Persecution, systematic persecution. And then he uses the word tribulation, which means to crush. This is the result of persecution when they're crushed under the weight of their suffering. In fact, the Thessalonians were suffering so much that they actually believed that they were going through the tribulation period. They were going through that time that Paul called the day of the Lord. So Paul writes to correct them on their eschatology and about the second coming, but he also writes to encourage them in their time of suffering. You know, and what he basically tells them here is that suffering is a necessary part of the Christian life. Jesus said in John 16, 33, in the world ye shall have tribulation. Paul said in Acts 14, 22, we must through much tribulation enter the kingdom of God. And so trials and suffering are a part of the Christian life. So Paul wants to comfort these believers. And it may be that you're here today and you're going through some trial. You're going through some kind of suffering, some kind of heartache. Maybe you're here today and you're suffering for your faith. Maybe where you work, you're kind of being persecuted. You're being mistreated because you name the name of Christ. Maybe it's your family. Maybe you're the only believer in your family that is a Christian and you're suffering because of that. You're being persecuted because of that. Well, I hope this passage here that Paul wrote to the Thessalonians will encourage you. And what I want you to see here today in these first few verses are two reasons why God allows the righteous 
to suffer at times, why God will allow his people to go through times of suffering. Here's the first reason. Write down this. Suffering advances our spiritual growth. Suffering advances our spiritual growth. God uses suffering to do a work of sanctification and to strengthen the faith of his people. Just like a blacksmith will take a piece of steel and he'll heat it up red hot and then he'll hammer it and then he'll plunge it into the water and then he'll go through that process again of heating and then hammering and plunging. Why is he doing that? Because he's forging a strong piece of metal. God does the same thing with his children. Job said, when he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Now, notice what was taking place in the lives of these believers. First of all, they had a growing faith. Look at verse 3. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is me, because that your faith groweth exceedingly. And Paul was thanking God for the faith of these believers because their faith was growing, and he could see it. He gives thanks to because of what he's hearing about their faith. He says, your faith groweth exceedingly. This is a combination of two Greek words, hooper, which means above and beyond, bena, which means I go, I go above and beyond. And really here, it's a picture of a tree that's growing beyond measure. We could translate it increased beyond measure or grown beyond that which could be expected. Their faith was growing more than a normal Christian. Why? Why? because of their suffering and tribulation. They were not growing in spite of their persecution. They were growing because of it. Someone said what fertilizer is to a plant, tribulation is to your faith. It causes you to grow. The ABCs of the spiritual growth are adversity builds character. And so God will allow persecution sometimes to come into the lives of his children. He'll allow suffering to come into the lives of his children because God is increasing your faith. But not only a growing faith, but also notice they had an overflowing love. Look again in verse number three where he says, because that your faith groweth exceedingly and the charity of every one of you all towards each other aboundeth. And the word abound here means to have more than enough. You're overflowing with love. In fact, the Greek word here has the idea of overflowing. If you take a glass and put it under a faucet and you allow the water to fill that glass all the way up and then you just leave it there and watch water overflow out of the glass, that's the idea of this Greek word here. It's just overflowing. It's abundant. Suffering and tribulation increases our love for one another in the body of Christ. As a church, we've seen people go through heartache and suffering. We, 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 we know people are going through that right now. Some of you, this last year, you went through a lot of heartache, death of loved ones, sickness, wayward children, loss of jobs, family issues. And what happens as we go through these things, you know what? We increase our love for each other. We help each other. We are dependent upon each other for encouragement and comfort. God helped the person who goes through these things and doesn't have a church family to help them through. That's what the church is for. The word saints in the Bible is always plural, never singular because God wants us to be together. He wants us to suffer together, not individually. And when Paul saw the suffering and the persecution that this church was going through, and he saw how their love was abounding together for each other, his heart rejoiced, because this was the answer of his prayer. You might remember in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, Paul says, look, I'm praying for God to, uh, to supply what is lacking in your faith. And then he wanted to say, I'm praying that your love will abound one to another. Well, God answered that prayer, and now Paul sees the answer of it. And God was using suffering to, to um, melt them together in love there in the church. And so you just mark it down, dear friend, that um, suffering will cause a true believer not to grow bitter and run off to themselves. It will cause them to grow better and depend upon the love and fellowship of the church to help them through their times of sorrow. During tribulation, faith reaches upward and love reaches outward. And that's what we see here in this church. Also, they had not only a growing faith and an overflowing love, but also they had a glowing testimony. Look in verse number four. He said, so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith and all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. Now, the word glory here means to boast. 
And Paul said, I'm, I'm glorying in you. I'm boasting about you because I see your patience. I see your faith. He was like a, a proud father boasting about this church. And the word patience here, the Greek word hupomone, it means perseverance. It means endurance. These believers were a testimony to other churches because they were persevering through all of their sufferings and all of their persecutions. You ever see some Christians, when a trial comes, they just seem to disappear? They just seem to walk away from God or the things of God. Someone said they're like alka or Christians. You put them under water and they disappear. When God puts you under the waters of affliction, you won't disappear if you're a child of God. People like that, they have no endurance. They have no perseverance. But tribulation allowed by God God is to build your character and endurance, your perseverance. Someone said mushrooms, they grow overnight, but it takes years and many storms to build a mighty oak tree. And so it is in the Christian life. One time a young man went to an older believer and said, would you pray that God would, would give me patience, would, that God would make me more patient? And the older believer said, of course, let's pray. And then he prayed and he said, Lord, send tribulation to this young man in the morning. Lord, send tribulation to this young man in the afternoon. Lord, send tribulation to this young man in the evening. And the young man said, oh, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Stop. I'm asking you to pray for patience. And the older, wiser Christian said, yes, but, um, you know, tribulation worketh patience, the Bible says. And that's so very true. During World War II, when enemy armies invaded North Africa, the missionaries had to flee, and there was great concern over the churches that they left behind. But when the war ended and the missionaries returned, they discovered strong, thriving churches. The sufferings of war purified the church and helped strengthen the faith of these true believers there in the church. What an encouragement this was to the churches of the free world. And Paul was saying the same thing about the Thessalonians. Look, I'm bragging about you uh, because of your faith. I'm letting other churches know how you are persevering through your times of suffering, what a testimony they were to the rest of the churches there. You know what? When God evaluates a church, he's not impressed with uh, the buildings. You know, I know we have a lot of beautiful church buildings in our country, but that's not really what impresses God. He's not impressed with innovation. He's not impressed with clever repackaging of the gospel to make the gospel more palatable among those who don't believe nor are, or is the church's stage worship the thing that impresses God or political awareness or social prominence or the size of the church. That's not really what impresses God. You know what impresses God? A church of people whose faith increases and whose love abounds for each other and who continues to persevere through difficulty and keep their eyes on God and the kingdom of God. That's what impresses God. And that's what this church was like. So number one, suffering advances our spiritual growth. But here's number two. Suffering reveals our spiritual worth. Look at verse number five, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer. Now, the Thessalonian believers' ability to persevere and endure their suffering and persecution, Paul said was a manifest token of something. What does manifest token here mean? It's, this, this translates one word in the Greek, which means clear evidence, or we could say an irrefutable proof or a sign of something. Paul says, look, the fact that you're being persecuted and you're suffering and you're persevering through all of this, this is evidence of two different things. What's the first thing? Number one, what does he say in verse 5? It's evidence of the righteous judgment of God. And what that means is, is that God will recompense you. He will punish evildoers. You being treated unfairly, you being persecuted for your faith, you suffering for Christ, you suffering because you're a Christian, I was just in Egypt, which is over 95% Muslim. Christians over there are persecuted, and they live in constant danger, constant. 
I was over there a few years ago and preached to some of the underground churches there and the believers there. Um, very faithful, and yet they live in constant fear. Some are beaten, some are ridiculed. They suffer all manner of discrimination. They, some are even martyred. All of that is evidence of the fact that God is coming in judgment. He's coming in judgment. God will severely punish the ungodly, the evildoer. Beloved, don't you ever think that the ungodly is getting away with their sins. Don't ever think that. Because God will punish their transgressions. An atheist farmer often ridiculed people who believed in God, and he wrote a following, this following letter to the editor of a local newspaper. This is what he wrote. He said, I plowed on Sunday, planted on Sunday, cultivated on Sunday, hauled in my, my crops on Sunday, but I never went to church on Sunday. He said, yet, yet I harvested more bushels per acre than anyone else, even those who are God-fearing and never miss a service. And the editor printed that man's letter, and then he added this remark. God doesn't always settle his accounts in October. And the editor's right. You can rest assured of one thing. God will punish the ungodly. How do we know that? Well, the Bible tells us this here in these verses here. Look down in verse number 5, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God that you might be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which also you suffer. Look at verse 6. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you, and to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty, mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Friend, God, when Jesus returns, God will settle his accounts. He'll make sure that those who committed transgression, those who refused to obey the gospel, rebelled against God's word, ungod those who are ungodly, shake their fist at the face of Almighty God and do their own thing, God says, the Bible says, they're going to be punished at the second coming. There's a saying in a courtroom, when a guilty man is acquitted, the judge is condemned. If the judge lets a criminal go unpunished, the judge becomes a criminal. In front of God lets an evil do doer go free, then God becomes a sinner. And I want to tell you something about God. He is holy, holy, holy. And he, that means that he will not let one half of one sin go unpunished. He will not. You know, we have these soft-headed theologians out there that say, God is too good to punish sin. The truth of the matter is, God is too good not to punish sin. Because he is holy, there will be a day of reckoning. And the Bible says that when Jesus Christ comes back, he will recompense. That word recompense there means to repay. He will judge the ungodly, those that have persecuted believers, God says that day of reckoning will come for them. They'll get their just due, which is one of the reasons why in the book of Revelation we see the martyred saints saying to God, Lord, when, how long, how long? You know, and the Lord said, just wait a while, just be patient. God's judgment will come, and we pray the last prayer that we see in the Bible, even so come, Lord Jesus. So, the perseverance of these believers through the suffering is a sign of the righteous judgment of God that will come. But Paul says it's also a token of another thing. Look again in verse number five, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God. And notice next, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer. Now, the idea here is not that suffering somehow qualifies us for being worthy of the kingdom of God, as if we're working for our salvation. We don't suffer so to, we can be received into the kingdom of God. That's not what he's talking about. What it means is, is that your endurance through trials, through suffering, is evidence that your faith is genuine, that God is working in us, preparing us for his eternal kingdom. Your perseverance in suffering, in suffering is evidence that you, as a child of God, you're worthy of the kingdom of God. Because if you go through a time of trials and suffering and persecution and you don't quit on God, you just continue on in your faith, you know what God says? There's someone who is worthy of the kingdom. 
You're worthy of the kingdom for which I saved you. And God, you might not wear a, a badge that everyone can see, but you have an invisible badge with Almighty God where it says, worthy of the kingdom. You're suffering. You're not quitting. You're continuing on in your faith. That's a person who is worthy as a child of God. And not every Christian is worthy of the kingdom. Jesus said this, he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. You're not worthy if you don't take up the cross that God has given you to, to bear. And by the way, the cross was a symbol of suffering and even death. If you're not willing to pick up the cross, you're not worthy of me, Jesus said. But those who do pick up the cross, whatever cross God gives you in his sovereign wisdom, whatever suffering, whatever trial, whatever persecution that God in his sovereign wisdom lets you go through, if you pick up that cross and bear it willingly for God's glory, God says you are worthy of the kingdom of God. What a blessing. I hope that God deems me worthy of the kingdom for which he saved me. But there's also another thought here, and that is, again, it is evidence that you truly are a child of God. You know, the last few weeks, you remember, I was preaching about the assurance of salvation. One of the greatest assurances that you're truly a child of God is that your faith continues on no matter how difficult the trial you go through. And that's, that's the story of Job. The reason we have Job in the Bible is to demonstrate to us that no matter how dark the trial is that you have to endure, if your faith is real, you will not quit on God. Remember the challenge that Satan gave God? The only reason that Job serves you is because look at all the toys that you give him. Look at all the things that you're doing for him. You take away all those things, he won't serve you. He'll curse you. And God said, okay, take him away and let's see what happens. And Job lost his wealth, he lost his health, he lost his family, all the things that were nearest and dearest to him. And did Job curse God? No. What does the Bible say? Job said, the Lord giveth and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. True faith, no matter how dark the trial, will not quit on God. In fact, true faith, when you go through a trial, you'll run to the Lord and you'll cling to the Lord even more. And you know what? You know what's more precious than gold? You know what Peter said? Peter was writing to believers in Rome that were suffering for their faith. And this is what Peter wrote, 1 Peter 1, 7, that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes. You want to know what's, what's more precious than gold? I'll tell you what it is. It's the proof that your faith is genuine. That is more precious than gold because by that you have the assurance that you are a child of God and it allows you to rejoice in all the blessings that God has given you, those that are genuinely his. To have that knowledge, that assurance that you truly are God's child, that is is more precious than gold. And one of the ways you gain that assurance is that you don't quit on God during trials, during suffering, during persecution. You won't quit on God. I started the sermon by telling you about Deborah Roberts, a young lady who was abused by an evil man. Let me read to you what she wrote. She, she wrote this. She said, people have said that being a rape victim must have been harder for me in some ways because I am a Christian. I say to them, I may have had hard questions to ask, but the joy in discovering his healing in the midst of such pain is the joy that can only be experienced by one who loves and trusts God. It is only through him that there is healing. It is only through him that my burden is lifted. It is only through him that I find peace. And you know what? This young woman bears a badge that says worthy of the kingdom of God. Her faith is real. So why do the righteous suffer? Paul gives us two reasons. Suffering advances our spiritual growth, and suffering reveals our spiritual worth. And so believers, you're not exempt from suffering. Some people think that because you become a child of God, you'll never have any bad days anymore. No, that's, that's not what that means. In fact, you might have to suffer because you are a Christian, because you do name the name of Christ. 
But are you willing to do that? Again, Peter writes to the believers. He says, look, beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trials with the, which is to try you. As though some strange thing happened to you. Stop thinking that because you're a Christian, you shouldn't go through trials. Like it's some strange thing. Peter said, stop that. Just expect it. And then embrace it. Rejoice in as much as you're partakers of Christ's suffering. If you're suffering as a Christian, you can rejoice because you are in the same line as your master, Jesus himself. You are partakers of his suffering. And then he says this, make sure you're not suffering because of the wrongs you do. Don't suffer as an evildoer, but as a Christian. And then commit your soul to God. Entrust your life to God. You can entrust your soul to God, the one who created you. In a time of suffering, that's what you do. You entrust your life and your soul to a faithful creator, Peter said. So, are you willing, if God in his wisdom ordains it, to go through a season of suffering so that he can strengthen your faith and you can grow in Christ and you can actually be an encouragement to other believers and glorify the name of Christ? One poet wrote this, Must I be carried to the skies on flowery beds of ease while others fought to win the prize and sail through bloody seas? No. No. I must fight if I would reign. Increase my courage, Lord. I'll bear the cross, endure the shame, supported by thy word. We're not exempt, exempt from suffering, but I want to tell you something, friend, we're not alone either. God, when he puts his children into the fiery furnace, he keeps his eye on the clock, he keeps his hand on the thermostat, he knows how long, how much, and you can say like Job, when he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. That's God's will for you. Let's bow for prayer together. If you're here today and you're going through a trial right now, I just want to pray for you. It's not an accident. God's sovereign over your life. Like the song that we sang this morning, God is sovereign over us. And he's with us in the fire. God has a purpose in all the pains that we endure and all the sufferings that we go through. His purpose is that we grow in faith and Christ be formed in us. So would you just take a moment right now, just pray. Just say, God, I submit to what you're, in your wisdom you're bringing me through. Give me strength, Lord. Give me grace. May my faith be purified. Help me, Lord, to glorify you in my trials. Help me, Lord, to be an encouragement to others. But, Lord, give me your grace. Help me. Let me say, that's my prayer, preacher. I need that. Call on the Lord right now and ask him to help me. God sees your hands. More importantly, he sees your heart, beloved. He's with you. He's with you. Just know that. He hasn't forsaken you. If you're here today and you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, let me tell you that no one suffered like Jesus suffered. No one was persecuted like Christ. And why did he endure all that? He did it for you, to pay for your salvation, to take your sin debt upon himself. On the cross, God's wrath fell upon Christ. When it should have fallen upon me, it should have fallen upon you. Jesus bore our sin debt. He paid the price for our sins. Why the suffering of Christ? So that you could have eternal life. And friend, you get that when you put your full faith in what Christ did for you. If you're here today and you've never done that, I want to encourage you right now. Say, Jesus, I'm putting my faith in you. I'm putting my trust in you and you alone. Save me, Lord Jesus. Would you pray that? Anyone here say, that's my prayer, preacher. I'm trusting Christ today as my Savior. I'm putting my full faith in what Christ did for me. Anyone here, I just want to pray for you. I don't want to embarrass you, but I certainly want to pray for you. Anyone here? All right. All right. Father, 
You know the hearts of these that are here. And Lord, I pray you'll use your word to strengthen believers and convict sinners who do not know Christ. Do your work, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Shall we stand together? Reverend Gorm is going to come.